Now, you know, no fructose, and this whole concept is, um, uh, it must be true because Tom Hanks is doing it. Um, you thought he would have learnt on Castaway and he went back to some bad old ways and now he's back doing the Castaway thing. <coughs> so, uh, are you ready? Where do we start? <coughs> Come back to being a hunter-gatherer. We're meant to survive eating seasonally, eating naturally. What I find really interesting is that now that I'm off sugar, I'm no longer hungry. It's fascinating. I've spent 40 years being hungry, or at least 40 years I can remember. Uh, my mum died when I was 16 and I adopted a few mothers and um, uh, my mate's mother's my wife's mother and uh, I was well known for coming off the sporting field and just going straight to the refrigerators and uh, had my pimples too, interesting. So I would like us to eat local, that's good for Tasmanian farmers. We've got arable land and a temperate climate. Um, this is the last place on earth um, that I want to be as I die young, as healthy as possible. I think we need to eat seasonal, we need to eat natural. So fructose, as I pointed out to you, is a unique carbohydrate. It's half of sugar. It's involved in this most elegant summer metabolism to produce fat for winter storage in every organ. I think it's a prolonged appetite stimulant. Oh, I think it asked to prove that. I think there is some... Um, I used to give a paper. I, I, I am a redneck. One of my registrars said that, um, Mr Fetke, you are a redneck, but I love your practice. I don't operate on smokers. I don't operate on people who are too fat. <clears throat> I give them a tool to try something different. Not that I don't care for them. I actually give them other options. Um, some of you will know my thoughts about off-road motorbike riders. I have an off-road quad bike. Um, but this is a bit controversial. Is fructose an appetite uh, stimulant or not? I think it is. I think the chemistry is almost there. And big sugar say it's not. I, I think sweetness is an appetite stimulant. And I'll talk about artificial sweeteners along the way. And I think if you find that sweet hit, it triggers a whole lot of things. Fructose does it more powerfully, but sweetness can do it as well. So I'm not a great believer in sweetness. <clears throat> we are addicted to sweetness. None of us like being conned. And this is one of the biggest cons of all time. We're being conned by sugar. The glucose half goes to your brain and tells you you're full. It's a hypothalamic response via insulin. It's beautiful. It tells you, oops, had enough glucose, had enough fuel, I can sit down and rest. The fructose, however, via free fatty acids and uh, an insulin effect again, actually tells you to eat more. But it does that for several hours. And it's meant to. That's what it do. You find that fruit tree, find it, gorge upon it, go back for more and more and more and more and more. Glute 5 receptors go up in the gut, you can stuff your face with it because you get one opportunity and one, only, one opportunity only. It is the most primitive survival instinct, sweetness. It's more primitive than thirst. Just remember that. So when you think you're weak and you're, not, you know, you're struggling with sweetness and trying to find stuff and you go back to the cupboard and the cupboard and the cupboard, it's actually sweetness. It's a primitive instinct. And if you recognise it, you're not going to be conned. Apart from the fact that the food industry is putting it in everything, they've worked out that it's an improved shelf life, <coughs> improves transportability, we love it. They've put lots of bright colouring packages on it. You've only got to go down the cereal aisle, you've only got to go to the counter with young kids and watch all that chocolate right in front of you. So we've been conned, conned by a molecule, conned by a big industry, and I hate being conned. What drives hunger? If you've got no food and you've got plenty of storage on board, fat secretes a substance called leptin. You may or may not have heard of it. And that just makes us all feel really comfortable, tells us not to go and eat anymore because our fuel tanks are full. And when we draw down upon those stores, we produce less leptin, we start feeling hungry, we start going searching for food. That's what the bears do. They sleep all winter, they're not fussed when their leptin levels go, when their fat stores go down, their leptin levels go up, they go out and it happens to be springtime. <clears throat> I 
if you, um, the other thing that happens with fructose, it actually increases the stimulation of a thing called ghrelin. Ghrelin is a uh, substance produced by the stomach that makes your tummy, or it's, it has an effect on the tummy, uh, stomach and it makes it grumble. And we've all felt hunger, grumble, 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 that's ghrelin. It's making you go along and find that fruit tree. And if we're actually taking in carbohydrate, we're having sugar going in, up, down, up, down, glucose levels going up, down, up, down. And we're in and out of it, we're constantly having fructose on board, it's constantly making us hungry. I used to get cranky at people who are overweight, thinking, oh, you're weak, you know. I used to get cranky at myself because there'd be chocolate there. I'd go back for more and more. Who's done that? Breaking it off and putting it in the fridge, breaking it off one by one, you know, hiding it in different spots so you've actually got to walk down the end of the house to actually get it. It's amazing how I can find it. Even when I thought I'd hidden it and I'm going searching for some, I'd found some that Belinda had hidden. <laughs> so wedding anniversary tomorrow. <laughs> Happy anniversary. I think she's perfect, but um, we've all got our old secrets. And uh, sugar was one of them. Trick number two, don't get thirst confused with hunger. All right? Often in Australia we don't drink enough, we're often thirsty. Our brains go, oh, must be hungry. When a lot of the time we're actually thirsty. And I'm a great believer in drinking plenty of water. One of the big tricks. I generally have um, a glass or two of water or a water bottle in the car and when I leave the office, I'll drink it all. So by the time I actually get home, I've actually had a water load, I'm actually reasonably full. I used to go home, oh, a bit snacky, have some chips, a few peanuts, have a beer, which is full of maltose. No, no fructose, though. And um, so a lot of times I've found that I get home and I'm not actually hungry. It's quite interesting. So what are the natural sources of fructose? And I question what we call natural. Fruit, well, it's local, it's seasonal, it's natural. But I don't think there's anything natural about bananas in Tasmania. I don't think there's anything natural about finding apples at this point in time. They're all harvested a few months ago. I saw a patient recently, a young bloke that I know, and he's had a bit of a gap year. And uh, I said, what's happened to your legs? I've mean, examined his legs on and off for a couple of years. No, covered in muck and I thought he had scabies. I said, I've been working in the fruit orchards, I've been in the apple orchards, I've been spraying for the last couple of months. There's not much natural about our fruit production at this point in time. Sorry about that with the Tasmanian farmers, but I've got to be careful. As I said, honey is seasonal, okay? It's not entirely natural. I think refined sugar in all of its form is not natural, and certainly not natural to go along and harvest sugar cane crush it in a mill, refine it, bleach it, then put it on our table. I think it's even less natural to have high fructose corn syrup, which is made from corn, done in a laboratory. Now, who, who invented high fructose corn syrup? Any ideas? No, the Japanese. Mm, they sold it to the United States because the United States had a corn industry. Actually, have to turn corn into dextrose and then make it into fructose. So Japan sold it to the United States. So who do you think won the war? This is not going live to the United States. But purely name dropping, I will send it on to Robert Lustig, who I communicate with quite regularly. So I want you off sugar, particularly the added sugar. Be aware of what it does for you. And if that's what you learn tonight, it's what it does. And if you make an informed decision, it makes you hungry, it makes you wanting more. So I want you off that added sugar. I don't think there's any role for soft drink. Lemonade, nice label. How many teaspoons of sugar in that? <laughs> Wrong. 11%, 66 grams. Now these little sachets, you see, okay? Teaspoon of sugar? Well, it's not, teaspoon's four grams, these are three grams. So how many are in there? One. You can count it out with me if you want.
8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. 22 of those sachets of sugar are in that 600 mils of Schweppes lemonade. I challenge anyone to get those 22 teaspoons and put them into some water and drink it for me right now. You can't do it, can you? So if you've got an awareness of it, you won't do it. So in 190 mils of Coca-Cola, there's five teaspoons of sugar. I don't want you on fruit juice either. 9.2% sugar. Half of that's fructose. Nonetheless, it's just an enormous load. Here's a new flavour, up and go. Give it to your kids as a breakfast nutritional supplement. 250 mils is five teaspoons of sugar. You see kids sucking away on it on the way to school in the mornings. Rob Fairs used to have this on his standard meat pie each day. Five teaspoons of sugar. Barbecue sauce, 46% sugar. Some of the tomato sauces are down at 11 or 12%, still enormous amount. You make your own tomato sauce, you can. Keep the sugar level right down. Use just tomatoes, use maybe a little bit of dextrose. A few recipes out there. Lollies, they look nice. 50, 60, 70% sugar. But they are fat free. <laughs> yeah, gluten free, heard that as well. Yeah, not toxic free, okay. No biscuits, sorry. High doses of sugar, high doses of carbohydrate. No cake. This is coming from someone. I apologise to all those parents out there. I would not take off children's plasters or adult plasters unless they brought me a chocolate cake. <laughs> Went on for the best part of 20 years. I'm 25 kilograms less than my, my peak weight. <clears throat> Used to have a standing order at Manfred's, Elfin Continental Cakes, and they'd say, oh no, he had that one earlier this week, you want to give him this one. Fridays in the rooms often take off three or four plasters, take the nicest cake home, take the ovens to the hospital, poison the nursing staff. In retrospect, take down a few down to the city mission. I was a nice guy, I dropped off chocolate cakes. I'm going around to town just poisoning everyone. Wouldn't it be interesting if all chocolate was covered in this wrapping? But it's not. 30, 40, 50, 60% chocolate. People tell me that uh, uh, if you go up the 80% uh, cocoa ones, um, they've got less sugar in them, and they, and they do. But, and it's okay to have some, but just recognise that it's a small amount. Don't think of it as a treat when you have your chocolate. Think it, oh, I'm in detox, I'm going to have a chemical hit now. It's a different way of looking at it, but Cadbury don't market that. Well, you know who owns Cadbury? Kraft. Who owns Kraft? Philip Morris. And do you think that the tobacco industry might just be involved in a little bit of the sugar industry at this point in time? I might not be long here. <laughs> no dried fruit, straight sugar, highly concentrated. One grape's got nearly a teaspoon of sugar. That makes sultana about nearly a teaspoon of sugar. So you get those little kids out, little packets of, you know, sultanas. Oops, just give them 30 teaspoons of sugar for lunch. Whoops. Zip around the schoolyard. Interesting, isn't it? I used to love sultanas. No jam. What do we do with jam? You know, it lasts for a long time. But we add sugar to it to make it last longer. No ice cream. Anybody gone out? and actually um, bought some cheap ice cream when you're out and about. It was cost three, four, five dollars. Now, I love chocolate, I love ice cream, used to love it, and I still quite have, you know, I might have a teaspoon every six months now. That was me, you know, admitting something, okay? <laughs> Look, if it tastes sweet, avoid it. 
sorry. <clears throat> um, it might have some other sweeteners in it, that's okay. But if it tastes sweet overall, it's probably worth avoiding, particularly if it's been processed. Fruit, oh, I get into a lot of trouble on this one. <clears throat> um, actually left some people hating me on my Facebook page at the moment, hammering me about fruit, you know, what sort of a moron I am. That was the simplest expletive I could come up with, which wasn't too bad. Um, fruit, local, seasonal, natural, okay? Local, seasonal, natural. Don't have a problem with it. Eat it in season. And if you want to eat a fair amount coming up this summer, that's fine. Just recognise what it's doing for you. And promise me, then you eat it only seasonally. There's fruit available all year round. There are charts like this and you can see it, but it does vary. Old fruit, traditional fruit, doesn't last very long. You watch it off the tree within days, short period of time, <coughs> rots on the ground, birds are eating it. Whilst it's ripe, they get all the best bits before you get them. So it doesn't last very long. It goes rotten. So our modern natural fruit, right? this is the way it's marketed. Gosh, that makes me feel good about having it. I don't think it's natural at all. It's full of chemicals, preservatives, gas. Less fibre, more, more sugar. I think that's what modern natural fruit is. It's plastic. It looks good on the wall. So what can you eat? It looks pretty nice, doesn't it? Real food, local, seasonal, natural. So we're going to go through what are low or no fructose foods. There's a heaps of them. There's meat. We've been eating meat for millennia, two and a half million years. It's a staple feast. Okay, It's not there every day. It's when you caught it, you used to feast on it. What's really interesting, when a lion catches prey, I only got told about this recently, it eats the liver first, eats the kidneys, then it eats the fat, the energy dense bit of the meat, of the, of the animal, and then it eats the meat. It eats the protein after that. It goes in that order. Liver, kidneys, fat, fat, fat. Then it chews away on the meat, sometimes leaves the carcass for other animals to have. The fattier the meat, the better. Love it. Guess what? It's cheaper. Go for pasture-fed. Grain-fed meat generally means it's been exposed to more polyunsaturated, more seeds, more seed oils, a higher polyunsaturated component. Something I only learnt recently is that the toxins in our body are actually stored in the fat. Certainly the polyunsaturated component is a very slow turnover. I mentioned that four-year period to try and get rid of polyunsaturated fats out of the system. So grain-fed animals actually have those toxins and that polyunsaturated fat in their fat. So if you've got a chance, eat pasture-fed meat. Don't worry about the fat. If it's a grain-fed meat, cut the fat off it. Soft science, but... We don't need to worry about it too much here in Tasmania. Chicken, love chicken. Love the skin on it. All right? We've been told to take it off because it's too fatty. Look at those poor... Well, I almost said a word there. Um, all those poor people uh, at the Heart Foundation who have been cutting the skin off. Well, it's, that skin's really nice, isn't it? You know, always when you've had a bit of that roast chicken, you leave the skin on? Or, the, you know, the roast pork and you have that bit and you feel guilty? Well, just chew it. It's good fun. Seafood is fine. Again, wild fish versus grain-fed fish. I looked at this recently. Um, it's there. They've got a higher rate of polyunsaturated fat within them, but it's tiny. Fish is fine. Just go for it. If you've got a choice, you might pay a bit more for the wild one, but I don't think it makes a big difference. Vegetables. Okay, all the nutrients of fruit are in vegetables. They're colourful. They're good for you. And accept the fact that they are um, uh, mass-produced and they've probably undergone some genetic uh, modification, but welcome to everything. Uh, they are low in fructose, they're high in fibre, plenty of nutrients. A uh, little trick here I just heard about the other day, someone told me, I've known about it for a long time, but uh, cauliflower rice, heard of that? Oh, there's lots of nods, I didn't know about it. 
tried it the other day, you just get cauliflower, you grate it up, there's your rice substitute, tasted great. I'm not known for my culinary efforts. Again, vegetables are seasonal, they're around all the time. And it's easy to find them, and I don't mind importing them, okay? We're not perfect in this world, we're not all hunter-gatherers, we are in the modern world, but let's eat, still eat seasonal vegetables even if they're not local. Anybody know what these are? They're cashew nuts. Well, it's actually cashew seeds. Okay, they're up a tree. They're covered in a skin which is very much like poison ivy. It's a major skin irritant. It's got a shell, and to get access to it, you've got to pick it off individually. You've then got to roast it to get cashew nuts. Nuts are fine, okay, but they come in a shell. Okay, I've got a variety of them here. I want you to think how much labour is involved in getting one nut out of one shell. I've got a pair of pliers in the kitchen and I keep that bowl there in the kitchen to remind me that when I go to the pantry and I grab a handful of nuts, how slack I've been by grabbing the handful of nuts because of the amount of labour involved in actually having those nuts there. Nuts are great, okay? Full of fat, energy-dense food, very good for you. No problem with nuts. Just have a think about how much labour is involved in it. So don't give up nuts. They're good for you. But just think about how much energy is involved in nuts. As for butter versus margarine, I trust cows more than chemists. Okay? Dairy's fine. As I said, we were raised on breast milk for millions of years. Lactose has been meant to come into our system. And we have lactase. The vast majority of us have lactase when we're born. And a lactose intolerance generally means you don't have enough lactase. And we actually produce less lactase as we get older. And if you take lactose out of your diet for a long period of time, it's down-regulated and we lose lactase. So therefore a lot of people who are lactose intolerant are in fact had lactase before and now they don't have quite as much. And as a result of that, then they reintroduce lactose into their system and then you get lactose intolerance. I don't know the answer to that yet, but I'm certainly looking at that and I'm wondering, whether, okay, well, what if you reintroduce... And people with lactose intolerance can often try a yoghurt or a low... a low fat... Uh, sorry, not low fat... a low lactose uh, yoghurt and then reintroduce the more dense or the higher doses of lactose as time goes on. Full cream milk, forget the rest, that's it. I mean, why take the fat out of milk, OK? Low-fat milk generally has a higher concentration of sugar in it. Check the labels, that's what it is. Um, I did a taste test in hospital uh, a year or so ago. We were all there um, about midnight, another one of those crazy nights, and uh, waiting in between operations, and I set up all these glasses of milk, light milk, full cream milk, and I got everyone to do the taste test. Um, the light milk tasted watery, um, but it was sweeter. Butter, love it. Lashings of it. Put it on your carbohydrates if you want. Um, cook with it, no problems. Love cheese. Cheese is good. Um, lots of fat in it. I love fat. Trying to convince my kids to actually have a cheese wedding cake this in the next 12 months. Some of you might have seen my blog on it. Um, you know, the traditional fruit cake uh, is full of sugar. Um, it'll make everyone at the wedding sick. It'll make them infertile. I want grandchildren. <laughs> Hopefully this video will go to my children one day. And, uh, but I'm being vetoed at this point in time uh, by the first wedding couple. Still got 10 months to go on the second one. Okay, double cream. Love it. Yogurt. I get asked so many questions about yogurt. Who gets confused when they go to the yogurt aisle? Okay. Plain. Anything that's sort of flavoured with fruit and it's got more sugar in it. If it's low fat, it's got more sugar in it. Um, add cinnamon to yogurt. Makes it taste a bit nicer. Uh, I quite like Salil. This is okay. This is brand recognition. All right. I'm just going to show you something. Salil, low, no fat low sugar, okay? So they've taken the fat out of it, it's low sugar. I'm going to show you something. 
local Tasmanian double cream, okay? And if you can see that. Mix it up. Now I realise none of you had anything but tea a little while ago. Yum. <laughs> More yum. If I'm dribbling, I am. Oops, a bit of double cream left. <laughs> I'll get into trouble for table manners later. Buy plain yoghurt. Don't be fussed. Add some fresh fruit to it. Probably berries. Okay. <clears throat> They're low in fructose. They've got some antioxidants. We'll talk about that in a little while. If I dribble? Okay. Eggs, love eggs. <clears throat> Back on the agenda, don't worry about whites and yellows and yolks and all that sort of thing. Um, this is one of the great myths that was busted recently in one of the, uh, I think it was the British Medical Journal. If you have a diet higher in eggs, you've got less cardiovascular disease. <clears throat> um, the recent literature just supports the fact that eggs are fine. Great snack food. I have eggs and bacon for breakfast when I can. Eggs and omelette. Snacks, I often have eggs in the fridge. All fine. <clears throat> Keep getting asked about alcohol. Well, yep. Red wine, 0.3% fructose. White wine, 0.6 to 1.3% fructose. There's about a teaspoon of sugar in a bottle of red wine, okay? So very low in fructose. So you can have your bottle of red wine, well, your glass anyway. It comes with lots of calories. Just be aware of the calories. So here I am telling you to go along, it's all right. Have your glass of red wine. Let's talk about beer. It's got no fructose in it. Guys love this. I say, look, here, go along and have beer. Have as much beer as you want. Well, not quite. Beer fills you up. You know that. Who's gone, um, had fish and chips, gone out for a meal, have fish and chips? You never go back for seconds. Right? You never do it because you're full. You've been given beer full of maltose. Maltose gets converted to glucose, goes to your brain, tells you you're full. Who's been to a Chinese meal and still eating at the end of the night, stuffing your face, never quite full on the way home, wanted to buy a pizza? <clears throat> now that Chinese meal, right at the beginning of it, you were given some uh, sweet and sour sauce with your entree. You didn't ask for it. And um, so what we do is we dip our entree into that sweet and sour sauce. We get an immediate sugar load, a fruct fructose load. We're hungry for the rest of the night. And a lot of Chinese food, a lot of... Uh, Takeaway food's got a lot of sauces in it, high in sugar, high in fructose, makes you hungry to keep going. <clears throat> so what about beer? Well, there's a lot of calories in beer. Um, two stubbies of beer is about the same number of calories. It's a Big Mac. <clears throat> now, I'm not a teetotaler, um, but if you have two beers before dinner, you've just had a Big Mac before you sit down and have a meal. And lots of people have a slab of beer on the weekend. I say, you really had 12... Big Macs for lunch. <clears throat> okay, artificial sweeteners. Only one slide. <clears throat> A lot of time spent on this one in the press. Books written about it. <clears throat> Whether or not it's uh, dextrose that uh, David Gillespie goes on about. Uh, I respect David, and I'm not saying anything against him, or what Sarah Wilson is uh, very much about stevia and uh, rice... Uh, Rice bran syrup. <clears throat> sweeteners are alternatives to sugar and sweeteners. Sweeteners to sugar are what I consider methadone to heroin addicts. We're addicted to sugar. We're addicted to sweeteners. And the trick with this is to come off sweeteners. And to do that, you need something. No problems with that. I used it coming off. Big withdrawal. Had fruit. Had that... Uh, diet Coke, diet lemonade, because I was craving the sweetness and it come down over a period of time. So it's a method of reducing your addiction to sweetness. And over a period, I don't care if it takes you three months or three years or ten years, just think about what it is. Sweetness makes you hungry, hungry makes you eat. Eating equals bad habits. <clears throat> Having sweetness still can be making you hungry in some studies. And this is another thing that the sugar industry, the food industry put up. They say, oh, sweeteners, it's not just fructose, it's the sweetness. So don't blame fructose. And uh, 
uh, I think this is a little bit of blurred area. Um, these uh, sweeteners are uh, not so much dextrose or maltose or stevia, but the polyols, the sorbitol, erythritol, are chemicals. Um, those oils, if you see on a packet anything in an oil, okay, eat that and you're going to go to the toilet with diarrhoea before too long. So that's what the polyols do, they, get, they loosen your bowels. Um, then there's a whole lot of other very you know, chemical additives with all sorts of numbers on them and you find them on the back of the containers and you try and then do the search and you find out what numbers they are. Carbohydrate, I want to talk about that. Why do people say they can't do without carbohydrates? They can't do without their carbs, have to have their carbs. Um, Tim Noakes out of South Africa very famous for writing The Law of Running, if it's in the athletes here, it's a very, very famous book. He's the guy who really raised the whole issue of carb loading for athletes. And we've, you know, we've all, you know, um, recently the Mark Webber uh, challenged <coughs> all these athletes, carb loading, carb loading, carb loading. Um, that's been very much the dictum for the last 20 or 30 years. Tim Noakes is type 2 diabetic now, and it's completely reversed his opinion, it's gone low carb, high fat. Um, that, uh, so therefore we need to change our way with the, uh, the whole high carb things for athletes. Carbohydrates are bland. They're made up of starches which are just recurring molecules of glucose. Modern carbohydrate is without fibre. I want you to try something when you go home. I want you to try eating your carbohydrates without something else. Okay, try eating a loaf of bread without anything else. Try eating all that rice without anything else. A bowl of pasta without the sauce. Potato just by itself. What do we do with it? We put toppings on it to make the carbohydrate palatable. Well, I just eat the good stuff that I put on top. I scrape the topping off the pizza and eat that meat and cheese. Leave all the carbs for someone else. Give it to the chooks and then I eat the eggs. Mm, got problems there. I just realised that, okay. <laughs> I'm a hypocrite, okay. All right. What about the wheat grains? You know, whole grains with fibre don't have a problem with it. Most uh, uh, bread products are less than 3% fibre, down 1%, 2%. But I see that some of the bread producers now have a high fibre loaves, okay, with fibre of about 10%. Um, I think that's probably better. The thing about fibre is it slows the ingestion, the uptake of that carbohydrate. Remember, carbohydrates just repeating molecules of glucose. And if it goes in quickly, it'll raise your blood glucose level up. If you put fibre in it, it just slows the process, so you get less of a peak. and It slows it all up. So you don't get the insulin spike, you don't get the fat deposition quite as much. So the same thing goes with rice. Now I think this is a huge topic, okay? We've been milling rice for the last 20 or 30 years. White rice is common, various forms. We don't eat that much brown rice. And traditionally, when we did have rice, it had husks in it, there's a lot of uh, fibre. And it's in the last 10 to 15 years, particularly in Asia, particularly in China and India, and in Vanuatu, because I'm intimately aware of what goes on with the food cycle over there, I keep, I watch it that with the introduction of white rice, without the fibre, we've got an explosion of obesity and diabetes throughout Asia. It's the next storm coming. Same thing in Vanuatu. We've taken the fibre out of our rice. <coughs> Same thing goes with pasta. Plain pasta, 0% fibre. Wholemeal, 10% fibre. Potato, we very rarely have it just by itself, you know. If we do have it and we have the skin on the jacket, well, we've just introduced fibre, it's a bit better. Um, we tend to put spices with it, don't have a problem with that. Or we fry it in deep oil and make potato chips. Um, last year I bought an air fryer. Seen those things? Um, like a, um, uh, a heating fan that circulates around and you can put chips in there or sweet potato and you can cook a kilo of chips with a tablespoon <coughs> of lard. 
So rather than a litre of oil, a polyunsaturated oil, <coughs> you can cook your chips up or sweet potato with one tablespoon of lard. It takes about 20 or 30 minutes, not quite as quick, but it's not bad. <coughs> okay, fibre content. Okay, if you're going to eat car carbohydrate, look for the fibre content. The more, the merrier. Okay, start looking for it. Um, it's all there. If there's none on the packet, if it says no, if it doesn't say fibre, it's got nothing in it. But if it's got fibre in it, they'll advertise it because now people are asking for it. So there are some grain biscuits out there which have got fibre in them. <coughs> okay, let's talk about fats and oils again. You've seen this picture before. I love saturated fats. I'm not keen at all on polyunsaturated fats. The difference between a fat and an oil is what it is at room temperature. Okay, at room temperature, a fat is solid. At room temperature, an oil is liquid. That's all. They're exactly the same structures, just a number of double bonds that differ. Okay, really simple. Butter. Cook with it, spread with it. High in, poly high in saturated fats, very, very low in polyunsaturated fats. If you want to try something a bit different, coconut oil. Very, very low in polyunsaturated fats. Got a little bit of sweetness to it. Some people like it, some people don't. If you are going to use an oil, then look at a fruit oil. And the fruit oil is most commonly around olive oil. Uh, macadamia nut oil is uh, sort of a nut oil, but it's certainly low in polyunsaturated. Um, if you're going to buy olive oil, okay, free plug for tomorrow, realising I'm not getting no uh, financial gain from them. Um, that's only 7% polyunsaturated component, whereas the others are between 10 and 13%. Start looking at the labels, you might just find, okay, so it's a choice thing. When you go shopping, go, oh, I'll buy that one at 7% rather than 13%. The market will move on this. Um, several months ago, I approached uh, Woolworths and Coles and wrote to their CEOs about that I wouldn't, <coughs> would they mind if they just changed their entire food product. <coughs> um, Coles didn't write back to me, but to uh, give Woolworths their due, they uh, wrote back and, uh, from the CEO and the vice president and uh, ended up having a meeting with their chief nutritionist for an hour. And, um, I said, and she said, the party line, oh, we follow the Australian dietary guidelines and what the Heart Foundation says and that's what we produce. And I said, um, look, I'm just letting you know that they're wrong. And, um, <laughs> and that um, I'm right. Imagine being married to me. Uh, but she said, um, oh, that's very interesting. And but after about five minutes, she realised that I might actually know something I was talking about. And I said to her, you might think that I'm wrong, but I know for a fact that Sarah Wilson sold 70,000 copies of her book, I Quit Sugar, in the seven weeks prior to that. Bearing in mind, I've not received a single thing from Sarah, okay, apart from discussions. So no financial gain there. I'm just happy to support her project. I said, you've sold... Se no, she's sold 70,000 copies. That equals 70,000 households in Australia which are now looking for stevia. And I said, I also happen to know that you've moved stevia from the bottom shelf to the middle shelf. You are responding to the market. I'll also know that if you look closely, and I've been observing it for a while, the fruit juice section is shrinking. It used to be 10 metres long, 8 down to about seven or six at our local one. Just interesting. The market is moving. They're demanding. You're demanding what needs to happen. Don't wait for Coles or Woolies. Anyway, at the end of the conversation with the chief nutritionist, I said, I realise you're not going to do anything as a result of this conversation, but I hope in five years' time that you remember the conversation that we've just had. And she said, and I, I wrote it down, Dr Fitke, I don't think I'll ever forget this discussion. <laughs> so... We can, can influence them, and if they're listening, they will respond. And they are responding, even though they may not doing it publicly, they're responding because that equals profit for them. Polyunsaturated oils, toss them in the rubbish. I think it's akin to having a house made of kindling. It's inflammable in your blood vessels, in the cell membranes of your, of your body. What do I mean by polyunsaturated oils? Margarine, canola oil, sunflower oil, vegetable oil, peanut oil. Look at the labels. All the oils have got them on it. All tells you the polyunsaturated component. <coughs> Most of them are trying to pride themselves about how much polyunsaturated they've got in them. And they're trying to hammer the fact that they don't have much saturated oil. 
so therefore saturated fat. So just toss them. Originally, the canola oils were actually used as engine lubricants, okay? Then they added colour and taste to them, so we can actually start eating them. And that's because butter and lard are expensive to produce. You've got to milk cows, you've got to kill pigs to get lard. So polyunsaturated oils, just poison to me. What about the olive oil margarines? I'll get told people, oh, I have this really healthy, it's olive oil margarine. Well, you know, why bother? Why bother with any polyunsaturated oil if you can avoid them? Sure, it's a bit of a hassle to, you know, spread the butter out a little bit differently or cook with it or slice it off, but actually not fussed how much you have of it. So, um, okay, food labels. All right, big topic. It's actually pretty easy once you start looking at it with a magnifying glass. I've put out a sheet there tonight um, of which it's got a few food labels on it and to try and gain some sense with it. I personally try and find food that has a sugar content of less than 2%. Certainly less than 4%, wary between 4 and 10%. I'd like to find fibre fiber present in the food. I'd like to find fibre present in the label. And if you can find it there, try and get it up around 10%. Minimise the polyunsaturated oil. Now, Australian food labelling is not too bad. It actually has it all there for us. You've just got to start looking. Up in the top right there, it says for virtually every packet, average quantity per 100 grams or per 100 mils. Okay, that's a percentage. Under the carbohydrate section, it says sugars. There is a difference between carbohydrate and sugar. Sugar is generally meaning sucrose. Not always. It can be, uh, can be lactose, can be maltose, but most times it's sucrose, unless it's dairy. So then look there and see what you find there. Now, the important thing about this is you need your glasses, all right? I've deliberately left it smallish because this is real life. Popcorn. Sugars, 0.6 grams per 100 grams. All right, 0.6%, very, very low. 7.9% fibre. Still a reasonable carbohydrate load. But if you're looking for a snack for the kids, it's not too bad. Let's look at that Philadelphia cheese next. Cheese has got fat in it, so here we've got some components of uh, saturated fat. And again, they're trying to tell us it's only got 23.8% saturated fat. Well, I love it. Bring it up there. Not quite as good as butter, but pretty good. It's also very low in sugar, okay, 2.3 grams per 100 grams. But this is dairy. This is cheese. That's lactose. Have as much as you want. It's pretty well no fructose. Up on the top right hand area, does anybody understand those daily requirements, average daily requirements? Well, I don't. I'm just going to prove a point to you. Neither does craft. <laughs> on it, it says, okay, there's an energy equivalent, fat equivalent, you know, recommended daily intake. I've actually spent some trying to find out who worked out what the recommended daily intake is for the average human being. Okay, do you know what the average uh, the male is supposed to be? 70 kilos, all right? So all the tests that are always done on average weight males, 70 kilos. Well, you know, 90% of Australian populations above 70 kilos. And here's a little bit political, and that's the women, okay? No, that's why I take, I take that back. So these recommended daily equivalents are really quite arbitrary. Okay, this isn't on the sheet. This is Kraft. I quite like peanut butter. I've always craved it. The peanut butter is actually, uh, the Kraft peanut butter is actually generally around about 8 to 9% sugar. But the new one, no added sugar, no added salt, is actually quite low in sugar at 4.7 grams. Okay, they've reduced it by half. It takes a little while to get used to, but it's actually not too bad. 
Um, it's got saturated fats in it, 10.2 grams, 10.2%. Uh, Very low polyunsaturated at 4.3%. Plenty of monounsaturated. Don't get fussed about monounsaturated. It's only got one double bond in it. Okay, Polyunsaturated means lots and lots and lots. So one I can cope with. So saturated fats and monounsaturated fats from the nuts are all fine. All right. The other thing that's on that is the percentage daily intake is based on an average adult diet of 8,700 kilojoules. If you go back, you don't need to go back, I'll just tell you, you do the calculations of the Kraft Philadelphia cheese one, the average daily intake of energy is 9,175 kilojoules. 8,700 for one person, 9,175. That's nearly a 400, uh, nearly a, a 500 kilojoule difference. I mean, it's, it's a huge difference. Kraft don't even know what our average daily intake is. It's the same two, same two labels. So how on earth are you supposed to interpret it if even the producers actually put mislabeling on there? Okay, here we are. Brula, whole grain, pasta. Okay, it's got sugar in it. It's only 3.5 grams. Truckload of carbohydrate, but we know that. Um, and the important thing about uh, Barilla is that it has 10% fibre, okay? It's up there. There isn't anything, any pasta I can find out that with any higher fibre content. So what I'm going to do with my carbohydrate is I'll recommend that you have a small portion of it and you cover it with topping. Whereas over time we've generally had a high portion of topping of carbohydrate and put a little bit of sauce on it to flavour it. Do the reverse. Okay, wheat bix, stable nutritional supplement. 3.3% uh, sugar, okay, it's pretty low, uh, that's raw sugar, it's on the label, so therefore, a couple of slices a week, a couple of pieces of wheat picks, 3.3% sugar, that's only about half a teaspoon of sugar in that breakfast cereal, isn't this beautiful package from, from Carmen's, makes you feel all warm and fuzzy with crunchy clusters, 22.3% sugar, 10 teaspoons of sugar, okay, in that one. Whereas half a teaspoon in wheat bix. Okay, why don't you buy Vitabrix? Okay, it's 0.4% sugar. Tastes virtually the same as wheat bix. Instead of having 3.3% sugar, you're only having 0.4%. This becomes down to choice. Choice will drive the market, market will drive the companies. Okay, oh, this has got to be good for you. Uncle Toby's yogurt. 20% of your daily whole grain target. Well, who's come up with 20% of your whole grain target? I've got no idea where that's come from. Oh, it's full of sunflower oil. And that bottom one, sulphur dioxide. The important thing about sulphur dioxide, on their label, sulphur dioxide, to maintain natural colour and shelf life. The other thing, if you look really hard about that label, it's 31.4% sugar. It's 20% of your whole daily whole grain target, yet it's got no fibre in it. Are you confused by labelling? I am. Here's a USA food label, okay? I spent a month in the United States in January of this year, had a lovely time. I think I'm the first person ever. I lost a kilo of weight in the United States. It was hard work. It took me five days in New York to actually find a loaf of bread that didn't have sugar in it. The United States, this is just straight confusing. It tells you amounts per serving. Look, there's 253 grams and the servings per container four, so you've got to divide 253 by four to actually find out what's in there. Then it tells you how many calories come from fat, as distinct from calories overall. It tells you the total amount of fat. It tells me what that is as a percentage of a daily recommended value. We've at least got a chance in Australia. European labelling is even worse than this. doesn't even give you the numbers. So you in Australia, we've got a chance. Oh, this is my favourite catch of the week. Freedom, honest, nutritious and free foods, okay? Three ancient grains, super muesli, advertising on the front of it, fructose free. 
And if you look down the labelling, okay, fructose not detected. Next line underneath it, sucrose, 5.3 grams. 5.8, sorry. So 50% fructose. Um, I wrote that and posted it on their page. They, they didn't like me for that. <laughs> Got quite a long-winded uh, reply, but effectively they say they might be reconsidering their labelling. Yeah, it, uh, welcome to social media, it's quite a powerful tool, I'm surprised by it. I think some of you are here because of it, so thank you. So sugar labels, okay. I try to aim for 10 grams of fructose per day, which means 20 grams of sugar per day. A teaspoon is 4 grams, so therefore I'm trying for less than 5 teaspoons of sugar per day. I think I've done that. It's taken me a while to get down to that level. I do that by learning to try and eat food which is less than 2% sugar. And over time, I'm actually not even craving sweetness anymore. So overall, trying to actually try for five teaspoons of sugar or less per day. But I actually don't care if you have how many, it's a matter of actually, for your sake, trying to become observant of how much you're actually having. Now I'm trying to do the right thing, I have some chickens. I haven't looked at my chicken food labels this week. Free range lamb mix. Doesn't get more expensive, this, you know. This is elitist chook uh, food. Look what the ingredients are vegetable oil. Okay, so I'm losing. So the chooks are going to get nothing now. <laughs> they can definitely free range on our leftover scraps. So even my best quality chook food has vegetable oil in it. Okay, let's move on to a few tips and ideas. This is a bit more practical side after the food labels. I want you to eat only until you're full. A lot of us actually eat after we're full. We finish off the what's on, left on the plate. We don't need to do it. Eat only when you're hungry and eat only when you're full. We used to um, um, uh, traditionally eat you know, breakfast, lunch and dinner, all that sort of thing. But our family now actually, as if kids have gotten older, we tend to eat when we're hungry, and if we're not really hungry, it's sort of, okay, we'll leave dinner and we'll have it a bit later, or if we do have dinner, we might have it smaller and cook it up and have it for breakfast the following morning. Uh, don't be afraid of that, you know. It's, we don't need to eat traditionally. Love water. Every time you're hungry, try a glass of water. Try and have a large glass 30 minutes before you leave to go home for work. If you're still thirsty and still hungry, try a glass of milk. Galactose is metabolised to glucose. It's got fat in it which is low GI. And sometimes for lunch I'll just have a glass of milk and a handful of nuts. It keeps me going for hours. Okay. Eat off an entree plate. The dinner plate of the 1950s is the size of an entree plate now. We have supersized the plates in our kitchen. Eat off a smaller plate. Fill it up it looks huge, right? You finish what's on your plate, you've only had half the meal of what you would have had if you'd filled up a dinner plate. Think about portion size. You can all make a fist, okay? Your own fist is the maximum amount of food that you should be taking in in that meal. And if you're taking it as an energy-dense meal, meat, vegetables, other protein, then there's plenty of energy there. None of, us, none of you are going to starve and waiting for the next meal. Bury the carbs, if you're going to have them, under the topping rather than the topping on the carbs. Enjoy that meal slowly. Most of the time now, we've forgotten how to chew our food. It comes processed. It's already been chewed for us in the manufacturing process. Now that's how they make fruit juice. You take the fibre fruit, you put it in a blender, you break up all the fibre and then all of a sudden it's already been pre-digested for you. So low fibre food doesn't need chewing. Chewing actually gives you a thing called satiety, it stops you from feeling hungry. And actually there's a whole reflex mechanism there to chew your food. It releases enzymes which are involved in breaking down the products in the mouth and starts to improve, improve the ingestion of the, of the, uh, the food products by the time it already gets to the stomach. Okay, we all lead busy lives. I think it's fine to cook once and eat twice or thrice. All right, you all know that. Leftovers are fine for breakfast. Fine the next day as well. We've got refrigerators, modern times. It's not going to go off in that period of time. 
Okay, meal times. All right, we've fallen into this habit in the last 50 years. So we've got to have regular meals. I can't think of anything crazier than actually having six or eight meals a day. That is just about you know, which is one of the topics talked about. I, I just don't understand that because we've never meant to have six or eight meals a day, except for two or three weeks at the end of summer when the fruit trees ripe. So if you are going to eat, and this is my philosophy, it's not for everyone. I'd like you to breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, and dinner like a pauper. The old thing I used to teach my patients, say, look, eat that way. There's no sense in eating a big meal before you go home, before you go to bed at night. You don't need to put petrol in your car before you park it in the garage. That was the analogy I used. I still abide by it. I don't think you need to stuff his face before you go to bed. Eating out, okay? A lot of people worry about eating out. Well, when I go out and eat, I just have meat and veggies. I think it's important to eat out and socialise. We don't do it enough. Apologise to all of our friends. And when you eat out, just ignore the fact that it's all been cooked in a polyunsaturated oil, OK? <laughs> you can't get away from it. Just, just enjoy it. Uh, this is one of my favourites. Uh, I like to smell food. I like to smell cake. It makes it really cheap for the wedding coming up if we just have the one piece of cake and everyone has a sniff. <laughs> Hopefully that gets to the kids. And there's proof in that. Smell is 90% of it, or taste is 90% smell. You know that when you've got a head cold, food doesn't taste as good. We all know that. So what we do, if you actually, and you can do a little test, we actually block your nose, put a sweet in there, chew it, and you'll feel the taste of that sweetness coming through. Then release your nose, and you'll get a second sensation of sweetness hitting your brain as the olfactory nerves take that sweet hit to a portion of the brain called the nucleus accumbens, which is the addiction centre of the brain, gives you a chemical hit. So when I jokingly do that in front of everyone in theatre, because um, there's always afternoon tea, you know, hospital staff are terrible. You know, they, anyway, don't start me. <laughs> I'll get knifed again. Um, I'll go there and I'll actually smell that food. So I actually smell it, I get a chemical hit. I get a release of that sweetness into my brain and it makes me feel good. I then get a second hit because I haven't been conned by it. And I get a third hit because I haven't got the calories which have gone on to fat production. So smelling that food makes me feel good, makes everyone laugh. Last year we had a rep bring in a couple of cakes into the tea room in the theatre suite and um, everyone, you know, stunned silence went into the room and uh, I, I thanked the rep for bringing along this afternoon tea for everyone and one was a pavlova with some fruit on it, the other one was probably chocolate, covered in chocolate and um, everyone said, oh, he's, what are you going to do? So I, I thanked the rep, I said, thank you very much. I'm going to have some of that and I'm going to have the healthiest thing I can see there. So I grabbed a bit of the cardboard box and ate it. <laughs> and the um, point was taken. <laughs> antioxidants. Okay. You hear a lot about natural antioxidants, having our tea, having our berries, and each week a new miracle juice comes out, um, a new tablet. Um, Dr Oz will probably have promoting something this week. There's, antioxidants are great. I think that's a fine thing to have. But let's think about the cause of ox oxidation and the oxidation is, is the problem with what we eat. If you don't eat anything that requires oxidation, if we don't eat all, those, all that fructose, we don't eat all that refined carbohydrate, we don't need any antioxidants for anything. So therefore, that's my take on antioxidants. If you want to take them as a tablet, all good and well, spend your money, I'm trying to save your money tonight. If you're going to eat fruit and eat those seasonal berries, they are higher in it. Tea is fabulous, it's got antioxidant properties. Fish oil. Okay, fish oil is effective in an omega-3 supplement. Uh, uh, before the introduction of grains, we used to have an, in our diet a ratio of about omega-3 to omega-6, about 1 to 1. Introduction about 200, uh, 100, 200 years ago got to 2 to 1, 2 omega-6 to omega-3. We're now up with our current food ingestion. You saw those graphs related to polyunsaturated oils. We're up to 25 omega-6 to 1 omega-3 now. We've increased that ratio dramatically. Now you've got two choices with fish oil. You can have 
16 fish oil to try and counteract that omega-6 that omega intake. Or you can cut your omega-6 intake way down. You don't need to have fish oil. I have fish oil because I'm trying in my game to improve those chances of decreasing oxidation. I'm trying to improve the ratio. I have very little polyunsaturated oil in my diet, at least that I know of. And I've tried to increase the amount of omega-3. Can I prove it? What's the dose? Oh, crikey, that's difficult. I have two grams a day. Okay. What do I think about vitamin C? Well, I actually like vitamin C. You know, it's in and out of the press for 50 years as being a good thing. You know, it's the argument, that's the good thing in fruit. It's a good thing in vegetables. Um, vitamin C actually inhibits uric acid's effect on the damage process. And diabetics who actually are on vitamin C have less tissue damage and have better outcomes than those who are not on vitamin C. So vitamin C has a role to play in uric acid metabolism. And if we're having a uric acid load now, having vitamin C is a good thing. It's cheap. I don't think it's doing anything bad for me. What's the recommended dose? Each of those little orange ones is about 500 grams. On top of my diet rich in vegetables, I have two grams. It's almost like a lolly, isn't it? I don't do it because of the lolly hit, but I can't prove the dose. Tried to work out the dose. The dose is okay. somewhere between 500 milligrams, which is one tablet, and 500 grams, which is a thousand of them. There's been some work done on you know, high, very, very high dose vitamin C treatments. I'm not abiding by them. It's very hard to work out what the dose is. Vitamin D, okay. All right, Tasmania, very high in vitamin D, or very high rates of vitamin D deficiency. What's vitamin D got to do with this? Now, vitamin D is actually uh, involved in the macrophage response of clearing out that inflammatory process in the blood cell, in the blood vessel walls. Um, it helps the macrophage, helps clear out that inflammatory trouble in the blood vessel walls. So therefore, in Tasmania, I think it's worthwhile finding out if you're vitamin D deficient. It's very common. And probably taking a supplement or taking your clothes off. Um, so uh, it's worthwhile checking a level. I'm not saying go out and just take vitamin D capsules. Most of you don't need to do it. But if your vitamin D levels are low, worthwhile going on to something and chat with your doctor about it. Here's a little um, trick uh, heard about recently. It's pointed out to me, uh, the spray on oils, you know, spray on olive oil. Um, I looked at one, it was a spray on olive oil. It was 65% olive oil. What was the rest? It was 35% butane and propane, okay? All right, LPG gas, okay, that's how it's propelled. Okay, that got tossed in the bin. Food chemicals, okay, our food industry is just covered in them. Um, it's hard to get away from them, uh, but they're out there. And uh, the more chemicals, I've seen, you know, stuff, if a package has got more than five uh, products in it, don't buy it. And again, I'm talking about going back to eating real food, eating it local, and trying to be as natural. Um, big topic, exercise, okay? You cannot outrun a bad diet. Okay, I believe it's 90% diet, 10% exercise. The history of exercise is quite interesting, right? Prior to 1950, we used to go off, we used to exercise to go off to war, right? To get stronger and faster than the other guy and survive. It was actually prescribed for mental health, you know, get out and socialise and interact with others. It was there to um, uh, improve your libido, improve your sexual drive. So if you had low sexual drive, you were supposed to go out and exercise. And it was actually prescribed to increase your weight. Not to decrease your weight, to increase your weight. And that's because it makes you hungry. We've all gone out and exercised. Oh, I feel hungry. Oh, I've done all that exercise. I can reward myself. And um, doctors keep saying you need to exercise to lose weight. And in the 1970s and 80s, it was all about weight loss, exercise, explosion of gymnasiums and fitness centres. You'd be happy to hear Launceston has the highest number of fitness centres per capita in Australia. All right. They're everywhere, in every corner. I just don't know how they're making money. Anyway, we do. Um, and who were the people who encouraged us to exercise, to lose weight? Adidas, Puma, Nike. Okay. A lot of us grew up with a pair of Dunlop volleys. You know, no brand shorts, no brand T-shirts. Now we're just advertising for them. And we're putting on weight like we've never put on weight, despite the amount of exercise we're doing. 
I swim. I think it's really important to keep moving if you're trying to exercise. Exercise is good, all right? Sport's bad, that's another topic, you know, but it keeps me employed as an orthopaedic surgeon. If you exercise, you build up tone and you build up muscle bulk and that improves your basal metabolic rate. It's actually good for you. It actually helps you lose, any, you know, lose weight over a long period of time. It has cardiovascular benefits. It has mental health benefits. But it does not make you lose weight directly. You need to do an enormous amount of exercise to burn off a little bit of weight. If I have a light beer, it's got 98 calories in it. I know I need to swim 400 metres to burn that off. If I have a full strength beer... It's 153 calories. And when I'm doing my laps, I work out these numbers, OK? I need to swim 600 metres to burn off that one beer. Or I could sit down and have a cup of green tea with its antioxidants and lose weight. So some days I feel like a swim. Some days I'll have the beer. OK, weight loss. If you're not losing weight with a modern concept of eating then I suspect you're still eating out of habit or you're eating out of boredom or you're eating out of comfort. And if you, in fact, start taking control of what you eat and having an awareness of what you eat and taking a real interest in it, bearing in mind we pay more interest to what petrol we put in our cars rather than what food we put and fuel we put in our mouths. So if you actually take that interest, I suspect you'll find and you stop and you only eat when you're hungry and only eat until you're full, the weight will come down. Slow and steady is the way to go. Don't panic if it doesn't come off too quickly. If it's not coming off too quickly, have a good hard look at the carbohydrates you're having. Where you think that's okay, have that pasta bread. If you're having two pieces, cut it down to one. If you're having one piece of bread, I say, have two slight pieces of lettuce and put all that good topping in between. There's a bit of work to say that we have an ability to hold a set point in weight. You know, you get down to a certain weight and you can't break through that barrier. Or if you're a child and you get to a certain weight, you can't then get back down under it. There's a bit of work being done on that. And if you're really, really struggling with that, sometimes there's a role for a ketogenic diet, but do it under the supervision of your doctor. Sometimes you can't lose weight because other things are happening. Don't forget endocrine disease. Thyroid disease is actually quite common. And again, if you're not losing weight under the guidance of your GP, Think about having your thyroid function done. <coughs> Can't go by without talking about hospital food. My patients, after an operation, wake up and are poisoned. At a time when I want them to be healthy, fit, and I want their immune systems to be going flat chat in the right direction, they're woken up to a diet of lemonade, orange juice, ginger ale, jelly, ice cream, chocolate cookies, and white sandwich breads. That's it. For a whole variety of reasons, that's why I'm campaigning. People are fed by the food industry, which pays no attention to health, and are treated by the health industry, which pays no attention to food. I do think that our modern diseases have major global health implications. I think our modern disease is related to our diet. I think that the combination of an excessive intake of sugar and particularly fructose, combined with polyunsaturated oils and refined carbohydrates, are toxic to my health. And if they're toxic to my health, they're probably to your health. We have reversed some of the cancer risks of tobacco we recognise the implications of tobacco and reversed a trend. The cancer rates are in the light grey, tobacco intake is in the dark grey. With a reduction in tobacco intake in society, we've seen a reduction in cancer risks. I do think it's time to recognise the health implications of a convenient diet that's high in fructose, polyunsaturated oils and refined carbs and maybe we can start turning around some of these health problems. So in summary, do not eat or drink sugar. Minimise the carbohydrates. Maximise the fibre. Get rid of the polyunsaturated oils. Eat only when you're hungry. Stop eating when you're full. And keep moving. You are what you eat, 
So don't be fast, cheap, easy or fake. Some say this whole concept of low carbohydrate, high fat diet is in a honeymoon period. It's trendy at the moment. There's a surge of interest and the honeymoon will not last. I'd like to point out to you, and I'm trying to remind us all, that I'm not reinventing the wheel. This has been around for two and a half million years. This was the dietary recommendations for the first half of the last century. We started creating convenience food and now we're paying the price for it. We're chipping away at that hole and we're digging a hole that's for ourselves. This is not a diet, it's a way of eating and personally I'm still on my honeymoon. It's about eating real food, it costs nothing. I don't think it's got any side effects at all. But you need to make your own minds up. I say, grab hold of that starter cheat sheet, it's there for everyone. It's all completely free tonight but it's also on the web. Download it, spread it around, take it to your GP, give it to your friends, say, your problem, your choice. You've got these funny symptoms, you've got these things, give it a go. You make your own mind up. And the fact that you're making your own mind up is amazing that so many people have turned up tonight. And uh, I'm investing in my health, retirement and my children's and you're welcome to join us. I love the concept of committed sardines. A school of sardines is massive, can be massive. And at a blink of an eyelid, it can turn right angles, it can change direction. It can take up the same volume as a sperm whale, but it can do that and just turn. Whereas a sperm whale, if it wants to turn around 180 degrees, it takes two to three minutes to do that. This term is a natural phenomenon term called committed sardines. So at any point in time, in that school of fish, there's fish on the edge doing things a bit differently. Arguably, a little bit more alert to danger. And when they sense that danger, they turn. They turn a few more people and then there's a critical mass and then the whole school of fish turns like that. I'd like to think that amongst us all here tonight there's a few committed sardines and we're turning. And what was the topic that was unspoken three years ago? Started being talked about two years ago and everyone thought I'd lost the plot again two years ago. It's becoming a phenomenon of actually going back to eating the way we're meant to. So to you all here tonight, it takes courage to stand up and speak. That's what I'm doing. But it actually takes more courage to sit down and listen. So I thank you on that notice. Thank you for letting me chew the fat with you tonight. Um, it's getting late. Um, I'm going to have a bit of a question and answer session to follow now if people want to stay. I uh, thank you for your time. I thank you for your support and um, thank you for coming. Thank you.